so you guys have heard this one. There's always three miracles that are referenced by the faithful about Jesus doing miracles. Whenever I say Jesus' miracles, I think of three things. The first one is what? What do you guys think the top three is? Number one, number two, and number three. You can just li- go ahead and say it. Raise- Lazarus is definitely one of them. Raising somebody from the dead will get on a list. Absolutely. What's another one? Anyone else? Water into wine. That's a really popular one. His first miracle. He mo- and then this one, feeding 5,000 people. It's like the top of the list. So I'm sure you guys have probably heard sermons about this before because this is like the hits, right? Um, have you guys heard of the sermon before? Um, it's a popular interpretation. It's not just the miracle of Jesus multiplying loaves, but they're sharing what they have, right? You, have you heard that sermon before? It's a popular one. It's great. Um, I think it also has some 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 backing up when jesus was first starting his ministry he was uh, tempted in the wilderness by the adversary and what was he asked to do take these stones and make them into bread and jesus goes <laughs> no thanks he quotes the bible he goes man doesn't live by bread alone but by the abiding word of god right unbelievable whoa jesus did a great job handling that uh, but then we're to believe then that he just shows up as like, bread, 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 bread. I get that. That they're probably like, you know what? He probably doesn't. But maybe it's that he's feeding others with the bread. So there's great, great evidence that he did multiply this bread. But are you guys ready for a third understanding? That's right. Something that only a Bible geek like myself would be really into. I am... To be honest, a nerd about that time. My undergrad, like when I was an undergrad, was in Judaic studies, Hebrew scriptures. I love talking about the culture that made, formed Jesus. So I have a question. Do we really think that at that time there weren't some people who had something to share? Obviously. That's a popular understanding. They had bread available. In this time, do you know what, like, really the big issue, the religious issue, the cultural issue that Jesus was really concerned about? If you go through scriptures, it's re- reiterated a tons of times. It's about this idea of religious observance over a care of people, right? That's something Jesus is concerned about. This observance, this dogmatic observance to ritual, to observance of things. So, I'll give you an example. What's something that, uh, that they, the critics of Jesus are really mad that his disciples haven't done this before they eat? They haven't properly washed their hands so they don't get no diseases, right? They, they, they should wash their hands. There are cleanliness rituals that they needed to observe that some critics are going, Jesus, I don't know if you know this, but your disciples haven't done that. The next one, you know they're picking grain on the Sabbath. They shouldn't, they're not actually allowed to do that if they're faithful. Because on the Sabbath, you shouldn't be doing work, right? Another religious observance that they're not doing. Jesus, I don't know if you know this, but you're eating food with sinners, tax collectors, which is an extension is unclean people. If they are willing to break the religious rule that they're doing already, obviously they're unclean people. So who you ate with mattered, who you hang around with matters. That's actually still a modern understanding. You tell me who you hang out with, I'll tell you all about you. That's a judgment about who you hang out with and how clean you are based on who you hang out with. So Jesus deals with that a ton. In fact, we talk about that a lot as people of God, that Jesus sits with sinners, that Jesus hangs out with people on the margins. That's why this story is really special. Is that concern in the culture that would have existed that they follow all the rules because your identity, your faithfulness is directly attached to how you observe the rules and rituals. So, um, has anyone here ever been to Disney right? A lot of planning is involved, and I don't know if you can tell this about me, but I'm not a planner. (laughs) What? What are you saying? What are you saying? No. My wife thankfully is. She's meticulous. 
The idea that we would go to Disney without a plan when Emily is involved is preposterous. I bet you to go anywhere without a plan is a bad idea. Fail to plan, you know, you're, gonna fa- you're planning to fail. That's, that's an idea. So am I to believe that people heard Jesus was in town, Jesus was performing miracles, Jesus was doing his Jesus thing, and a group of people were just like, forget food, let's go watch. Let's go to a deserted place and let's watch. A planner would go, well, then let me make some sandwiches. We're not just going to leave the house like this. We're not just going to go see somebody. Then the religious rules, too, would extend beyond. So we can assume that some people would have food to share at that time. But here's the big one. At that time, who you ate with explained who, what kind of person you were. So 5,000 men, plus women and children, it says, are at this. Who's, who here would assume everyone there has adequately washed their hands? Mm. who here would say i believe these are all religious people that have followed all the rules so i can eat with them no what the disciples are doing here is not just saying hey let them go get something to eat they're kind of cleverly saying let them go do their thing because in order for a big contingency of faithful people to go see jesus to be coming up on mealtime. The planners are going. But more than that, everybody is going, who do we eat with? So they say, the disciples go, let them go off to the towns. Let them buy their meals. That's a nice way of also saying, let them go do their thing. Because what's going to happen is they're going to go, if they're observant, the observant people are going to go find a place to break bread together, say the right prayers, wash their hands, eat their bread appropriately with people that are fine, upstanding individuals just like them. But you can't do that with this mix of people. So the disciples go, hey, Jesus, let them go. And Jesus goes, why? Because we know this about Jesus. Jesus is all about upsetting that apple cart of expectations and observance. And he goes, let them eat. Sit down. There's enough. Jesus knows that there are planners in this group who have prepared sandwiches. But Jesus is also daring that community to put away some of their assumptions about one another. They're daring them to put away those presumptions of uncleanliness, of otherness. And they're saying, why don't you sit down together and break bread? The miraculous thing is, they do he says sit down and they do which you guys i don't mean to say that's a that i want to say this as somebody who's talked about hebrew scriptures and studied that like really this is a very big deal that all these people are eating together this is the height of breaking the rules of cleanliness to sit there and break bread with an absolute stranger you tell me they know it if i ask right now who here has brought something to eat bring it out time to share with the whole class you go no i'm not gonna do that because it's awkward it's not it's not um polite you know it's something we don't want to do we don't want to expose that we're there's a whole lot going on for them to sit down take out what they have which is clean food There are rules about cleanliness. Remember, how the food was prepared. And they're like, I'm going to eat this and also hand it to the next person. It could be completely wasted on somebody who is unclean, right? The rules say if they're unclean and they touch it, that clean food is now unclean. And they pass it anyways. At the end, 12 baskets of leftovers? Even, obviously we can presume Jesus multiplied loaves. The more miraculous thing is that somebody sat down with somebody they don't know and ate. That's a heck of a thing. A heck of a thing. In our modern context, I think we struggle and go straight towards 
the quantities. How is Jesus going to do this? We get into, man, he multiplied the fish and the loaves for 5,000. But the wildness of people eating together is not to be overlooked. The assumptions that exist in a culture that says, here's how you do things right. Here's how you do things observantly. Here's how you do things faithfully. Does this thing where it divides people. Because you're judging your own cleanliness, right? What does that mean about the other? You're judging their cleanliness as well. Causing you at times to have to, for cleanliness sake, assume the worst about somebody else. Assume the worst about your neighbor. If they're not clean, I'm not going to mix up myself with that. What a miraculous thing that they break bread together. I've seen a miracle like this where the presumption is... Totally wrong. Um, I've probably told you guys, I've been, I was in the uh, earthquake in Haiti. So um, in 2010, I think, yeah. So uh, I was there for a few days. And then on that day when the earthquake happened, it was, the world shook. We then were wandering around in the dark. It was horrible. There were aftershocks. And we were ushered by the UN to this airfield to sleep because there's nothing that could fall on you then. So it's like a whole city is in this place. If you've never slept just on dirt, no sleeping bag, you get real dirty. That's just a side tip. Um, We're sleeping there, feeling the aftershocks in our body as we slumber. And the next day, as if it feels like things couldn't be worse, we're now hungry too. We're like, well, great news, we're Westerners. We got heaps of money. You know, uh, Haiti's still full of impoverished people, so obviously we can solve this problem with money. So we say to uh, one of our Haitian leaders, we're like, is there somebody who can, like, find some food for our group? And they go, I know a guy who can get us some bananas. He has, he can find us some food. And we're like, bananas are perfect. So we give him money to go get us some bananas. And we give him more than enough. We're being generous because we're church people, Right? So we give him more than enough to go get the bananas. He comes back. I don't even know how he's carrying it. Like a Santa sack. And I was like, well, we gave too much. Whoa. And he hands out the bananas to the group. Exactly what was asked for. And he's done. And he's got this huge sack of bananas. And I was like, clever dude. Took that extra money. You know, he's going to sell bananas. He He got bananas for free. Great. Assumption. Because after that, the guy then continues handing out bananas. And I was like, oh, this has got to be his family, right? It's got to be loved ones. Reaches into that sack, he hands out more, and I'm like, Man, he's got a huge family. He's got a really big family because he keeps reaching in this bag and keeps handing bananas to people. But particularly who he's handing bananas to are like women, children, older people, the vulnerable. And he keeps reaching in this bag. And I'm going, man, I don't think this is just his extended family. He's extending this gift further and further. And finally the bag runs out. And he comes back. And he's grinning ear to ear. And he sits down. And he's sweating because it's Haiti. So it's always hot. And uh, we're sitting there eating our banana. Looking around. I'm looking at all these people that have these bananas now. That this guy has handed out. And he's got nothing and he is just pleased as punch he looks at me and he goes and I go my assumptions were way out of line because for him he saw an opportunity to serve his serve the neighbor he saw beyond expectations he knew what was probably assumed that he would do and he went and whatever the assumption is it doesn't matter i'm going to feed somebody in need i'm going to feed the most vulnerable people in my community he had this idea of a kingdom of selflessness because at the end again he had nothing so i was like where's his bush a little bit he's like nah i'm good (laughs) just proud as he should be as anyone would be when you feed somebody who's hungry What happened there was a destruction of one, my assumption, two, a destruction of my prejudice. The kingdom of God had come near. What that was, was miraculous because a miracle by definition is simply a surprising event, a welcome event that is not explicably seen in a natural or scientific way, right? It's considered to be a work of divine agency. 
I have no better explanation at that moment, the awe of like, huh, that it sticks with me still, then this was a holy moment, a divinely inspired moment, a miracle surprising me. That's a moment that I can never forget because my assumptions were challenged and changed. And let me just say, it was welcomed. It continues to be challenged. This season, Good Shepherd is going through uh, a lot of transitions. It's really exciting and also heartbreaking as Pat is, uh, has announced her retirement, Pastor Pat has, and Pastor Pat would remind you, it shouldn't be a surprise. It's still challenging because we love Pastor Pat. We're also in this time as we're working, uh, we have a few people from council working on our budget as we're talking about what this means to grow this ministry, to serve others in need, to grow the mission of this congregation. It's a really challenging time, but as Pat would remind us, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised about this. I say as we go forward, in light of what we know about Christ, as we go forward through this time of transition, we do it very well with courage and confidence courage and confidence that the unexpected might just become a reality we do it with that kind of confidence of faith of joy for what good can come this time is honestly a time of good news because the spirit is still moving and still calling us to break bread and grow this ministry of love and mercy peace and hope restoration and healing we have like I told the little ones, an abundance of riches here, an embarrassment of riches, I'd say. <laughs> we have an abundance. We have more than we need if we think about all that God has given us. How are we going to take what God has given us to do something miraculous, something incredible and unexpected? What it'll take of us is to have courage to sit down with one another and share. What it will take is for us to sit down and break bread together. And from that, something beautiful and unexpected may happen. And I will tell you, I've seen glimpses of it. The kingdom come where all are loved. All. All are fed. All. All are cared for. All. It's a big job. But God has given us more than enough to carry on that mission. And for that, I say thanks be to God. Amen.